1-6-7 in Auburn. Coach, it's your uh, first year in the SEC without Coach Saban after his retirement. I'm curious about your relationship with, uh, with Coach Saban. If you, have you reached out to him much after he's uh, stepped down? And, and also, does it, does it feel different going into this league uh, this season with, uh, with a new head coach at Alabama? No, I, ha- I have a great relationship with Coach Saban, and as I referenced in the uh, big room, I, have, I pay so much respect uh, and so much, uh, I, you know, just credit to um, what I learned because people forget that it wasn't the nine years at Alabama. It was the one year at LSU and the one year at the Dolphins. So to have 11 years to work for what is the GOAT, he is the greatest of all time in my opinion, and it's not really close because of the, the time in which he did it. Uh, it was a lot of, um, what's the right word? Um, it was very competitive environment. It was not like a single team dominance and he dominated for a long time. So we have a great relationship. Uh, obviously we communicate more now uh, than we did in the past as we were competitors, but there's always been a mutual respect and uh, a lot of appreciation and probably more now seeing him you know, at the ESPYs and seeing him on TV and seeing the things he's doing to give back and be the torchbearer. I just have a lot of respect for him. Left side, third row. Coach Daryl Dapperich with the Locked On Network. Um, kind of give us a little insight as to the process on how maybe a homecoming opponent is selected. Obviously, there's been a little bit of a firestorm with Auburn, the deepest oldest South's rivalry being your homecoming opponent from the Auburn side. Kind of wanted to get a little bit of a peel back the curtain on how that process and how you choose your homecoming opponents. I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like, I don't. I, I, I get the schedule just like everybody does. And, uh, I mean, other than, you know, your non-conference games, I mean, you, you have to go try to schedule those out 10 years in advance, which is uh, an impossible hurdle. But I had no idea that that was even the case. So, when you, you say peel back the curtain, uh, I have no idea how that's selected or, or what goes into it. Right side on the end. Hey, Coach. Michael Brawner, WNSP in Mobile. The AJC report said that there were 24 driving-related arrests and incidents surrounding Georgia football since that January 2023 tragedy. Why does this keep happening, and what are you specifically doing to address it? Yeah, I think the number one thing is disappointed. You know, anytime you have a situation like that, uh, you want your – kids, your players, to make better decisions. And uh, and I always say you you can't be outcome-related, and I'm very disappointed in the outcomes, but I am very pleased with our process we put in uh, in terms of education, uh, driver safety, requiring defensive driving, uh, education, talking about it, having leaders stand up and talk about it, bringing speakers in and talk about it, suspending players, dismissing players, which we've done. I don't know to this point any coach in college football that suspended a player for a driving citation. We have. We have. And we've also dismissed players based on uh, driving citations. Nobody's done that. So uh, hopefully they get the, the idea and the information. But we have a really good locker room, and I feel really good about that. Like, I love the players we have. I love the, the, the locker room we have. We have good kids. We got 45 kids yesterday playing, battling a uh, breast cancer golf tournament to raise money. So we, we, we got kids that go to Camp Sunshine, the entire team, and do a lot of good things, but uh, not representative of what we want when they make mistakes like that. Left side, fourth row. Hey, Coach. Ben Bob at Global 3 News in Chattanooga. Cole Spear is someone that's been in your program for a few years. When Malachi was in here, he sort of perked up when I brought him up just how, how much of a, a leader he's grown into. I, I, and he talked about how excited he is to see the role he's going to step into for the team this year. How is, have you seen him grown into that leader, and, and what is that role maybe this year that you foresee him stepping into? He's just such a hard worker. Everybody loves Cole. I mean, he's, he's – uh, you know, first of all, he's tough. He's physical. He plays on special teams. You know, he might not be the most dominant wide out. He's not a guy that's just going to win off the line every time. But he, he gives you great work ethic day in and day out. He holds the standard high in that room. He started contributing more and more on special teams last year. He's been able to stay healthy. You know, he's had some hamstring issues. He's a really fast uh, guy. And he, that's his weapon on special teams is his speed. But I, I love working with him. He's another great example of we talk about our locker room. I love our locker room. I love the culture we have of our kids. And he's, he's indicative of that. Right side, front row, and then pass the mic to the aisle, please. Coach, uh, Steve Moulton, WZZ, and in Huntsville, Alabama. Coming out of spring, uh, what do you like most about this team in particular, and what's your biggest question heading into the fall? 
Whew, I don't know, Steve. I, coming out of spring, I loved the practice environment, the competitive nature between the offense and defense, the battles we had on the field. Like the, the practices were very spirited, it seemed like. And uh, I enjoy that. I think when you have good spirited practices, they get more out of them. And it doesn't feel like this mundane, boring work. So I really like that. Uh, as far as areas we got to work on, I mean, the depth of the defensive line, I don't think anybody in the country will tell you they got enough depth. I don't think we have enough depth. Uh, we don't have a great depth at offensive line. We're years past. We were probably two and three deep. Right now, we have a very experienced offensive line, but we don't have a deep offensive line. So uh, some of that's been attrition. Some of that's been portal. You, you, you have to continue to create depth because you don't know when it's going to glare its head within the season. Second row on the right. Shahan J. Rogers from CBS Sports. Uh, Coach, I was amused a little by your, your NIL joke out there. I'm curious, what's kind of the state in your mind of NIL at Georgia? I, you lost me there in the beginning. You said my NIL what? Uh, the joke about Nike and, and Dan Lanning. Oh, uh, yeah, about yeah. Dan Lanning having the, 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 the treasure chest to open yeah. up and get whatever he wants. Yeah, but what, what was your question directly? About? Yeah, I'm curious about your thoughts on the state of NIL at Georgia right now. I think it's in a good place. I mean, our kids are competitive, and, and you know, we, we, we are different than most. We have a, a system that, that is, we believe you come in and you work your way up. You don't come in and make more money than starters. And philosophically, we stand by that. And if that costs us a player, we think we win in culture because we don't want players that feel like, there's an entitlement for a freshman coming in. And I think a lot of schools made that mistake early on, three, four years ago, and you could have some upset locker rooms. We're going to err on the side of you earn what you get, and the more you stay and play and contribute, the more opportunity you get at NIL, and that's kind of the state of our NIL. We'll go to the aisle here in the second row. Hey, Coach, Jonathan Hoppy with WTVM in Columbus. You mentioned Michael Williams and his versatility. Mm -hmm. Uh, what do you see from him and maybe a different role on the defense this year? And, and what do you think he can bring in that new role? Well, he's very versatile. He's very talented. He played defensive end, which would be a five technique, nine technique, six technique, four eye, all that for us last year. He'll continue to do that. We think he gives us the versatility to go outside and set edges um, and, and create plays. We've got more depth now at some spots inside that we can bump him out. Um, he's athletic enough to play and stand up, um, but he's also big enough to go and battle and, and, and fit up on some big tackles. So uh, we're lucky to have him. We need more guys like him, but better than anything he does on the field is his work ethic off the field and what he stands for. I, I, I enjoy having Michael around and, and what he brings to our team. We'll go here on the front row. Spencer McLaughlin, Locked On Podcast Network. Talk about Carson Beck. Had a great season a year ago, but where do you feel he can, if at all, still improve going into year two as a starter in this offensive system? Well, his approach to, to watching tape, finding out what defenses do, knowing what they're doing before it happens, the approach he has to our defense. You know, he can instill confidence in our defense where last year – I think he was focused on what he did for our offense. He can be an overall factor for both sides of the ball this year and, and really help the confidence of the defense. Front row. Coach Eric Bailey with Tulsa World. When Georgia played Oklahoma in the Rose Bowl, uh, all offense, no defense. Brent Venables has turned things around. Can you talk a little bit about the job Brent's doing at Oklahoma and what Oklahoma brings to the SEC now that they joined the league? Yeah, the great traditions, what they bring, uh, tradition, rich history, the, what a tremendous job Brent did at Clemson as a defensive coordinator. And he's, you can see those same elements, those same characteristics of toughness, attacking. Uh, he's going to always be good on defense. He knows defense. He understands how to attack offenses. So as he gets the players, he's recruiting more and more in there, and they're going to be a dominant defensive football team. And I think that's kind of, you know, SEC has always been known for really good defenses, and he brings a, another one with him. Left side, second row. Coach Davis Baker, WSFA in Montgomery. Uh, out of all the battles you've had with Alabama, you've only, you've only played them once in the regular season, which was COVID year, limit capacity. What's it like preparing to go to a place like Brian Denny that will feel likely like a playoff game? Well, uh, you know, I'm not going to be dismissive of going to play at Brian Denny. It's hard. But when you play on the road in the SEC, everywhere is hard. I mean, it is just difficult to play. The passion and energy on road games, people don't, Go ask a veteran, veteran SEC coach about road wins. 
there are only good wins. There are no bad wins. And it's not any different when you go to, to Tuscaloosa. It's a hard place to play. The passion, the energy, the players on the field, huh, they're, all, they're, they're all good. And uh, that's a challenge that we, we kind of embrace that. We love that. We like going on the road. We like being the, 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 the one against the many. And I think you have to embrace it. Right side, third row. Hey, Kirby. Brett McMurphy with Action Network. Um, when you were at Alabama, Nick took some chances on bringing in some assistant coaches that had had some issues in the past. Um, I talked to Lane about it, obviously Sark. Now that he's gone, do you see any current head coaches that will kind of fill that role and maybe bring people in to give them a chance, try to give them a second chance to kind of revitalize their career like Nick did? Yeah, I, I don't know specifically that I can say somebody that would do that, but I think every coach – you know, deserves that opportunity. I mean, um, we're human. We make mistakes. Um, things happen. I mean, people get second chances all the time in, in most professions. So uh, I certainly am glad that Nick did because it, it, it started my relationship with Lane, who I have immense respect for um, and enjoyed getting to know and, and have even enjoyed more. Our relationship has grown since the time we spent in Alabama together. So um, I think it's a good thing, and, and I think Nick started it to say who's going to – carry that torch or, or carry that banner, I, I don't know that. Left side on the aisle. Coach Carter Yates with Dave Campbell's Texas football. Now that there's a second Texas university in the SEC, does that change the geography of your recruiting process at all? No. I mean, we've recruited Texas for a long time. Texas is great high school football. We've had a lot of starters that have come to play for us from Texas. Um, obviously, Texas and Texas A&M can't sign all the good football players in this state. They, they, they're they going to go to other places. So it's uh, geographically, it's bigger than the entire SEC. The, the size of it is just humongous. So we're going to continue to recruit it, you know, regardless of two, three, four teams in the league. We only have time for two more questions. We go on the right side on the aisle. Coach Billy Jones, George Blaster Show, Nashville, Tennessee. I'm curious, London Humphreys, you guys add him from Vanderbilt through the portal. Was he a guy you guys ID'd at the high school level or just something that you guys kind of saw as you were scouting Vanderbilt and in that game last year that you thought he could be a contributor? Talk about maybe how you found him and what you think he'll add to the team next year. Yeah, excited about what he can do for us. Uh, wonderful family, you know, two uh, athletes as parents. And um, once he went in the portal, it was an area that we needed some help in. We were losing a lot of wideouts, senior-laden group, and uh, he provides depth at that position, and he's a, a, a really good football player and an excellent person, and we're excited to have him. Final question over here on the left. Hey, Kirby, Zach Klein, Channel 2 in Atlanta. With the iPads now being allowed during games, how will you take advantage of that? Could it be information overload, and what do you hope to get out of that new technology allowed on game days? Yeah, I think quicker feedback to the players. Visually, they see things better than when you draw them up. So I don't know that it will be as big an asset for coaches as it will be for players. We tend to get good information from up top, our guys that are up top watching it. But getting to show that information to players will be critical. I think the implementation of that is really critical for us as coaches because coaches are not always technologically savvy, and we've got to really practice that to be good at it. A lot of times our players are better um, at doing those things than us. So the implementation of that will be critical. Coach, thank you very much.